everybody. Whoa, this mic is different. Um, we're going to get started. There's always this long period of general introductory stuff, which is good because there's probably a whole bunch of people who are at Michael Smith Labs Theater going, where's the round? The sign is now up. Thank you, Simon, for signing us. So hopefully everybody that is over there thinking rounds is in its usual space will make their way over here and then through the maze that is Woodward IRC to essentially get here on the territories of the Musqueam people um, whose learning and storytelling has been happening here for centuries. Um, so we are grateful to them um, for being able to be on their territory today. Thanks, Joe. Um, so, hey, Jen Gardy here, your friendly rounds host. Um, hello to, oh, there's the camera. Hi, everyone that's <laughs> online. Um, today is always a, a special rounds event. When it's Halloween rounds, we start thinking uh, a couple months ahead of time about what could we talk about that's suitably spooky and gross and creepy. Uh, last year, it was, of course, zombies. It was the real public health science behind the zombie apocalypse. And this year, we've gone for something, uh, I guess, equally bitey, but more <laughs> realistic. Uh, we have gone for rats. Uh, I'm not going to lift my dollar store rat up because he's holding this caution tape down. But this is the, the star of our show today. Um, Rounds like this are always fun because we get to kind of take a lighthearted look at some of the stuff that we do in public health. And today we get to feature an amazing project that's been happening um, in the SPPH for years now, the Vancouver Rat Project. And whenever we do a rounds about something communicable, diseasey, um, we have a wonderful chance to invite our friends from the BCCDC Public Health Lab to come tell us about uh, all sorts of interesting communicable diseases. So we've done that today too. You've got SPPH and BCCDC Public Health Lab speakers uh, here to talk to you about these guys. Um, so in terms of housekeeping business, um, the questions, as always, can be tweeted to hashtag SPPH rounds. Um, if you want CME credit, there is an evaluation form. Um, this link will go out afterwards, and you can find it from the SPPH website as well. Learning objectives, I will not read them off the screen. You can enjoy reading them there. Um, but yeah, really, today is all about uh, having a little bit of fun with and nobody has a conflict of interest. And what's coming up next? Me. Um, so I get the pleasure of introducing the first speaker, me, um, Jen Gardy, <laughs> Assistant Professor in the School of Population Public Health and a Senior Scientist in Genomics at the BC Center for Disease Control. And uh, because the RAT project is kind of the main theme of what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to do a quick intro on One Health, uh, the concept of One Health. So Bob Marley famously sang about One Love. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about One Health. If the slide changes, there we go. Um, I will not. I will not sing about One Health. That would be the scariest Halloween rounds ever. Uh, if I were to use this microphone for song instead of talk, um, but inspired by Bob, and we'll see how this ties back to Bob Marley in the end too. Um, those of you who are keen consumers of the public health literature might have read this book at some point in the past. Uh, this is a book by David Quammen, who's a fantastic author, and it's called Spillover. And as you can guess from the title and the little subtitle on the book, um, it's all about uh, where might the next pandemic come from, specifically what sort of zoonotic emerging infectious disease has the potential to become the next uh, Ebola, the next SARS. Uh, it's a fascinating book, and it really takes you through the history of a lot of our recent diseases of public health concern, which are zoonotic in origin. Um, everything you could think about that we've been concerned about recently seems to be a zoonosis, whether it's Ebola, MERS, SARS, HIV even, um, every flavor of influenza you could possibly think of. So many of these things have their original um, reservoir in wildlife populations. So Spillover is a fantastic book talking about the process of spillover. Um, this is a figure from a Nature Reviews genetics article that my colleague uh, Nick Lohman and I wrote. It should be out in the next month or so. These are figures from the uh, advanced author proof things that we got. And I'll give you the punchline to this paper later on towards the end of my brief intro. 
Um, but this is one of the figures that kind of helps set the stage for the paper. And there's a lot of different ways of thinking about spillover. There's a lot of different frameworks for it. But this is one that we like because it's fairly simple. Three stages. There's pre-emergence when a disease is circulating in a wildlife reservoir. It is usually bats if you are trying to find the reservoir of an infectious disease. If you just guess bats, you're generally right about 50% of the time. Um, I didn't dress up for Halloween today, but I did wear my most sort of bat like <laughs> t-shirt, swoopy swoopy, in tribute to my favorite wildlife reservoir. Um, and so what you get is a pre-emergent stage where the disease that generally isn't causing any sort of symptoms in its wildlife reservoir will jump into a sort of middleman species. And here it's a pig. It can be a lot of other things. Um, it is frequently pigs, but SARS you saw it with civet cats, uh, MERS with camels. And so you've got this pre-emergence stage where disease is transmitting in animal populations only. Then you get this localized emergence where the disease will jump from the middleman host or the middle pig host um, into humans, but just single jumps. There's no sustained human to human transmission. And the humans that tend to be uh, infected in that stage are people that are at the front lines of the human-animal interface. People like farmers, people uh, working in uh, animal processing plants, veterinarians. And then once the virus, it's usually a virus as opposed to a bacterium, once it's had a couple little evolutionary hops, skips, and jumps, uh, it can often uh, adapt and become able to transmit um, person to person in these sort of sustained chains. And if they are not as big enough, and if global travel patterns and other things contribute um, to the, the system in just the right way, you can end up with an epidemic or even a pandemic. So this was actually nicely demonstrated on film. Um, Stefan is going to set up a clip. Um, again, people that enjoy consuming public health in their spare time outside of work may have watched Contagion, uh, the film. <laughs> Anybody that takes Dave Patrick's Control of Communicable Diseases class will have also seen this. I believe it's an assignment in your classes to watch and critique Contagion. So I'm going to show you, and I will talk over uh, the final scene in Contagion. There's no dialogue here. Well, just just a very, very. Oh, there's me talking. <laughs> Stephen will mute me. Um, so there's no dialogue. There's a very sort of dramatic soundtrack here. But at the end of the movie, you see where the disease that sort of wreaked havoc on a global scale came from. Um, and it's really, as far as infectious disease movies go, Contagion is actually a really good one. Yeah, you can go start, I'll just be yakking over this. Because they hired an actual virologist to come up with the backstory. It's not like, you know, outbreak with Dustin Hoffman. This is a much better movie. So what you're seeing here is humans encroaching onto animal habitat. This story is actually based on the emergence of Nipah virus in Malaysia in the 1990s. It was obviously not as severe. But you've got these bats that have um, a preferred feeding area. Here they're eating bananas, Nipah virus, they were eating the dates of the palm trees. And so they're in an area where humans are now building facilities for, wait for it, agriculture, pigs. Um, so you've got this bat who's sort of hanging up on top of the uh, pig farm and they're pooping. And there are viruses in their guano, gets into the pig populations, Pigs are brought to market. I hate this part. It makes me sad every time. Sorry, little pig. Um, and you mercifully don't see what happens to the pig, but he ends up now on the table uh, at the restaurant in, I think this is Hong Kong or somewhere in the vicinity. The chef has been putting his hands into and all over the pig, and then he puts his hands all over Gwyneth Paltrow, <laughs> and it causes the end of the world, basically. And this is just yet another reason why Gwyneth Paltrow is terrible for science. She's <laughs> <laughs> bad. I think I mentioned it in the first round, so I can see if we can work that into every round this year. Um, so that's basically the process of spillover on film. You have the wildlife reservoir to animals at the human animal interface and then into humans. And so recognizing that these spillover events happen on a fairly regular basis, the One Health discipline um, sort of emerged uh, and really started to get formalized around uh, 2004. Lots of different definitions out there for this, but um, fairly simply, they all kind of speak to this general concept that it's all about understanding human, animal, and environmental health together. 
And in 2004, the Manhattan Principles were formulated, it's sort of the 12 commandments of One Health, and I won't go into any great detail, you can read these for yourself. These are just a couple of them that really focus on um, how One Health relates to communicable disease and communicable disease surveillance. And the sort of TLDR version, too long didn't read, is um, that human, animal, and environmental health are intimately linked that a disruption to one system will cause disruptions across all of those other systems, and that if we want to do better at surveillance and at epidemic prevention and outbreak management and control, we really need to develop enhanced holistic surveillance systems where we're looking not just at human health, but at animal and ecosystem health as well. And we need to involve a variety of stakeholders in that dialogue. Um, so One Health is kind of interesting. Um, there's a group, a couple groups within One Health that think it might even be possible to predict the next pandemic, predict the next viral spillover event. Um, and so for those of you who follow the little uh, breadcrumbs that Alex leaves that lead you to places where faculty are in the media, um, you might have seen this article in The Atlantic uh, the other week. This was written by a journalist that I know, Ed Young. Um, I'm quoted in here, as some other colleagues are. And it was talking about a paper that came out on Tuesday where uh, two researchers in uh, Sydney, Australia, two virologists, uh, wrote a paper that said, hey, it's just not gonna be possible to predict the next viral spillover event. There's too many factors at play. There's a couple of very large, well-funded initiatives that are trying to do this, um, but that, their paper basically said, you know, it's kind of impossible. So Ed went out and talked to people that believe in the idea that you know, we can predict the next viral spillover, and he talked to the skeptics as well, myself among them. Um, and what was interesting is that no matter who he talked to, whether it was people that strongly believed you could predict the next pandemic or people that said, no, that's hooey, we all agreed on one thing, and it was that if you adopt a One Health informed surveillance approach, enhanced surveillance of human populations and of animal populations in the right places, you might have a chance of not predicting a pandemic, but detecting it in its early enough stages that you can stop it and it never really turns into something uh, dramatic. So I said I'd give you the punchline to that Nature Reviews genetics um, paper. This is a model that we've proposed for something that we've been talking about for a few years and we named in an earlier article, I guess about three years ago, called Digital Pathogen Surveillance. And it's really informed by a One Health approach. Um, and it leverages the power of new DNA sequencing technologies, very portable sequencers that you can take out into the field and use for both uh, diagnostics, if there's a sort of fledgling outbreak, or just for routine surveillance of whatever population you're interested in. So you couple sort of portable genome sequencing um, to a One Health surveillance approach. You can use something that's a topic for a whole other day called digital epidemiology to inform where you might be doing some of those things. But together, by considering all of these bits of the system, um, we might have a chance of spotting these interesting spillover events, these little signals, um, at their very, very earliest stages so that we don't end up with infecting the entire world. Um, so this was really all just to kind of set up some of the stuff that you're going to be hearing about later on with the Vancouver Rat Project, which is a beautiful example of a One Health Surveillance Project. And while it's not likely that you know these little things here are going to cause the next great uh, epidemic here in Vancouver, it's important that we be looking in them to see what might be happening. So I said I'd bring it back to Bob Marley in the end. That song, One Love, has this lyric in it, and that's really kind of the ethos of One Health. If we all get together, if human environmental uh, and animal health people get together across agencies, um, you get state and non-state actors participating in this, if we all get together, we'll feel all right because we're not dying of the next great amazing infection and spillover. So that's basically your One Health lead in. Oh, I won't spoil the surprise. Um, I, will, <laughs> I will go next to introducing uh, our second speaker. As I said off the top, um, Halloween spooky rounds about communicable disease give us the chance to invite our friends from the BCCDC Public Health Laboratory and the Department of Pathology Medicine. Uh, so we have my friend and colleague, Agatha Jassim. She is our clinical microbiologist slash clinical virologist uh, at the BCPHL. She does amazing work and she's a super science communicator. And now that I've told you about One Health, she's gonna narrow down on some of the specific things that humans can catch from rats. Welcome, Agatha.
unlocked it. Okay. <laughs> Agatha, is, Agatha is making her way to the stage. And you can just click. It's pretty easy. Okay, perfect. Ooh, okay, thanks for having me. I've never been to an SPPH round, so it's great to meet other people. Um, okay, so yeah, my task is to tell you about some of the diseases that you can catch from rats. And I'm hoping to do that uh, through a couple of cases, so hopefully it'll be a little interactive. I'm going to start off, I hope, a little bit easy. Uh, the first case is called the Black Death. Um, and so the case is an urban dweller in 14th century Italy. And um, two days later, after existing in a market somewhere in this urban space, he develops a fever, chills, weakness, and a swollen lymph node. Does anybody know what's causing his disease? Not you. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard bubonic. Bubonic plague. Bubonic plague, exactly. Okay. So one of the notorious um, diseases that you can get from rats, and I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Oh yeah, click this way. Um, yes. So that is a plague, which is caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. And animal hosts are wild rodents, um, but also urban rats. And the key is that these are rodents or rats that contain fleas. There are other species of animals that can harbor uh, fleas with the bacteria as well. And so most cases of plague are bubonic plague, um, as was mentioned, that's 80 to 90 percent, and they're caused by bites of infected fleas from these rodents. There's also pneumonic plague, and that's the really, really nasty one, um, and that's transmitted through respiratory droplets, so it's also a, a worse transmission route. Uh, the epidemiology, now, uh, it's rare. So back in the 14th century, uh, the plague, or the Black Death, wiped out about 50% of Europe's population and also had great effects in other countries. Uh, but now it's rare. Um, in North America, mostly rural cases attributed to interactions with wild rodents. But, you know, I brought up the plague because epidemics still do occur. We don't think about it a lot in North America, but actually there's a big outbreak of plague right now in Madagascar. Something like 70% of the cases are pneumonic plague. And, um, and I think since August, over 100 people have died from this infection. So epidemics still do occur. Uh, so some of the symptoms with bubonic, after fever, oh, I didn't say incubation period, so that's a really important thing. Every virologist and microbiologist has to talk about an incubation period after you're exposed, when these symptoms occur. So for bubonic, it's about two to six days after fever, headache, kind of this, you know, general malaise, and then there's swollen, painful one to two lymph nodes, and those are the buboes that are characteristic. Whereas with pneumonic, you also start off with that fever, headache, weakness, but then you get a rapidly developing pneumonia, um, and that's often fatal. So the overall fatality rate of plague is 50 to 60 percent, but pneumonic, if it's untreated, it's 100 percent. Now, um, after the 14th century, we can treat Yersinia pestis with antibiotics, like one penicillin, doxycillin. Um, so uh, bubonic plague still there's only about a 10% estimated mortality rate, but with pneumonic, it's still estimated to be 50%, so quite a deadly illness. We can diagnose it in our lab, most of the time looking for antibodies, but also um, doing a PCR looking for the bacterial DNA in blood and tissue. And so again, you can treat with antibiotics for treatment, but prevention, no vaccine. And I was trying to put maybe a few funny things, avoid crowds in the 14th century. Um, I don't know. It's amazing that, you know, we don't have plagues in some settings, but we still have epidemics in others. So it's clear that some of this disruption that Jenna was talking about between us and our rat populations, our urban rat populations, but of course, sanitation is important as well. Okay. Next, so just uh, honorable mention to <laughs> some of the other diseases that you can get from ticks and fleas from rodents. Uh, so plague being one of them we talked about, spotted fevers, I don't want to occur often here, but in other places in the world from rickettsial species. Typhus fever also, um, that's another one from fleas, because some of these are ticks as well, from rickettsial uh, species. Tularemia, we do see cases here, um, but often they don't come from rodents. In Canada, it's more of an interaction with rats, so they say like, um, don't mow the lawn over a, a rabbit. Sorry, it's Halloween also, but that is literally one of the precautions that they say, right? Because they may be harboring Francisella tularensis, which is the bacteria that causes tularemia, and that's how humans can get it still in sort of North America today. Or from bites with rabbits, but um, anyways. <laughs> so we'll move on to the next case. Um, 
This one's called the Killer Swim. So this is a true case. This was one of the early cases that was identified in Hawaii. It's a high school student swam with his football teammates at Kapena Falls near Honolulu in Hawaii, and he had a cut on his hand, and that's important. Mm -hmm. The next day he developed high fever and a flu-like illness. Um, his sister took him to the clinic, true story, three days in a row, and um, this was in the 80s. They said it was flu, they discharged him, they, you know, they didn't know what it was. He got progressively worked and made it to the hospital and unfortunately passed away. Anyone know what caused his illness? Leptospirosis? Yes, leptospirosis. Okay. So, causative agent there, another bacteria. This one's a spirochete. Um, so it's worth showing a picture of this long spirally thing. Um, so it's caused by leptospira interrogants mostly. Animal hosts are the rats. A um, few other animal horses. And I put star, star, star dogs. Because actually in North America, um, especially in BC and around this region, where we don't see leptospirosis uh, a lot in humans, we're not tropical enough, it's mostly places like Hawaii, dogs can actually get leptospirosis in our warmer months, and our wet months, where there are many, um, and they can get quite ill. There are very few cases of transmission between dogs and humans, um, but it is a severe illness in dogs, so if your dogs ever sick, consider leptospirosis in your dog. And I have two, so you know, we've got to think about this okay. stuff. Uh, so transmission through the skin or mucous membrane contact with water. And it is often these abrasions and cuts in your skin that will allow the bacteria to penetrate. Uh, and um, yeah, epidemiology, it's kind of unknown because there are milder cases, but maybe one to 10 per 100,000 people in temperate or tropical climates, warmer months. Incubation period, as for exposure, Early symptoms occur, you know, two days up to seven days, but then there's some later symptoms, which are about four weeks later. So those early symptoms are sort of high fever, that influenza-like illness, again, hard to diagnose. And that's still true today, actually. If you've had, you know, a kid was swimming in the water, I mean, he could have a lot of things, comes in looking like he has the flu. And then, um, but later, if the person doesn't recover on their own or isn't treated with antibiotics appropriately, um, meningitis can occur, kidney and liver failure, as well as pulmonary failure. So it is a 5 to 15% fatality rate. Again, we can diagnose it in the lab, looking for antibiotics or DNA of the bacteria, um, and, and we can, uh, sorry, using for, looking for antibodies, and then we can treat it with antibiotics, um, no vaccine, maybe enjoy the water, maybe don't enjoy the water, it's too strong, but maybe consider um, that your water may be contaminated. So, which I didn't mention, so how you get it from the water is the water is actually contaminated with rodent urine or feces that contains the bacteria, leptospira. Um, so be careful. Uh, so other uh, diseases that can be transmitted when food or water is contaminated with rodent urine most often, but feces, other secretions. So leptospirosis was one. Haver Hill fever, we don't see that a lot caused by bacteria, um, but we do see rat bite fever from when you get bit by a rat, by a rat caused by that bacteria. Lassa fever is an interesting one. This one we might not hear about a lot, but it's um, important in West Africa. Uh, there's been small outbreaks in the last couple of years in Nigeria. And um, it, over there, there's this food called gari. I don't know much about it. I've only read about it, never tried it. But basically, they, it's made out of some cassava tubes or leaves, and they're laid out to dry um, outside the houses, like shown in this picture. And then um, rats or mice um, will urinate on it. It will go into the food source, and people will eat it. So that's one of the ways that people get Lassa fever. And Lassa, by the way, is a hemorrhagic viral fever, similar symptoms to Ebola. So it's again one of the things that we have to think about in the public health lab in terms of how we're going to be at least prepared for some of these spillover events and events if, if people end up coming over to our country with these sort of diseases. Okay, last one. <laughs> uh, this is case is called the deadly dust bunny. This is also a true case. Uh, this is a recent case. This one actually, I believe, is from August or September of this year uh, from British Columbia. So this is a 44-year-old male from the interior who was cleaning out his old truck on his rural property. Two weeks later, he developed flu-like illness, 
with mild diarrhea. Subsequently, symptoms that came later were shortness of breath and some other pulmonary symptoms. And this patient actually also did not get better um, and expired from this disease. Anybody know what caused it? Antivirus. Antivirus, yes, exactly, antivirus. So this was antivirus pulmonary syndrome. And the virus that causes the syndrome in North America is synombre virus, but there are other viruses like Andes virus that causes a uh, antivirus pulmonary syndrome in places in South America. Uh, here it's actually a mouse, not a rat, technicality, but rats can also spread this disease. So here is a deer mouse. Um, and the transmission here is inhaling dust that's contaminated with rodent urine or dropping. So unlike leptospira, where you sort of get in your cut, the urine goes, here you're actually inhaling dust. So the classic story is like someone sweeping out their cabin or their old truck, et cetera, in rural areas. It's rare, but it does occur, and it does occur in British Columbia. And what's interesting is the incubation period is one to eight weeks after exposure. So you have to remember, it's a lot of historical digging. And you know, some of these things people don't think about as exposure. Well, I was cleaning out my cabin in the summer. I mean, hopefully many people do that. <laughs> um, so it's hard to actually get that exposure history. Early symptoms are that influenza-like illness, again, as you've seen with others. But the late is coughing, shortness of breath, the lungs fill with fluid, and there is a 38% fatality rate. And, there, and there, is, there are no antibiotics that can treat this, or antiviral. As you know, many of our viruses can't be treated. Um, but if a patient is recognized early to have antivirus pulmonary syndrome, good supportive care um, will help decrease their chances of it being fatal. We can diagnose it in the lab looking for our antibodies or, or the viral RNA in this case, um, in various lung tissue or blood. No vaccine. And maybe the take home message is don't leave your cabin <laughs> next summer. Um, <laughs> but maybe the take precautions. So wear masks, or if you do find a dead mask, a dead mouse in your cabin, you know, throw it out with gloves, etc. Okay. And then uh, honorable mention again to some of the other things that we can get from aerosolized rodent urine feces or secretions. Antivirus pulmonary syndrome is the one we talked about in North America. That's the Sinombre virus. There's also hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. Again, another group of antiviruses that can cause this. Um, there, it's not so much a pulmonary syndrome, but as you might have guessed it, you can get the fever influenza-like thing, but then renal failure, acute shock. Uh, the really bad one is Hantan virus, uh, found in Asia and Russia. Uh, but the milder one is Sol virus, and we have this one actually in the Americas as well as other places in the world. And um, what's interesting is the Sol virus has been attributed to outbreaks um, of antivirus uh, fever with renal syndrome recently in the US. So associated with um, interactions with pet rats. And it's thought that the person who was, I guess, distributing the pet rats or wherever they came from, there was some sort of um, contamination and then they went all over to these different states and people got infected with soul virus. But this is the milder form. And then, and there was a last case just last week of a teen and her mom who got infected from their pet rat. Um, and they decided in that case actually that they weren't going because you know public health will advise to actually um, cull the rats, you know, put their pet to sleep. But they decided they didn't want to do that, so the family was quarantined instead. So like I said, there are choices for your pets. Hopefully, you learned about some human illnesses as well as some things that pets also get and your pets might get. Um, and this is my last slide. So thank you. Thank you, Agatha. You know you're in the company of a clinical microbiologist or a medical microbiologist when they're very clear about the distinction between things you can get from just generalized rat secretions versus aerosolized <laughs> rat secretions. I appreciated the, the difference there. So now to bring us on into the home stretch, it's our homegrown rat project researchers, Kaylee Byers and Michael Lee, um, talking about the Vancouver Rat Project Everybody at SPPH has to have heard of this project because it's amazing. It's been going on for several years and is one of the coolest things that is happening in public health in this city. But I will let them tell you about how cool it is. I'll turn it over to Kaylee and Michael. Welcome. It is the coolest. We think so. 
That's good, too, because we pretty much dedicated our lives to it, so if we didn't think it was cool, we'd be really hooped. Um, thanks so much for having a, a nerd night themed on rats. I'm really enjoying making this like an annual rounds thing. It's the Halloween version. Um, so you just heard about a number of diseases that rats can potentially transmit to people, and we're going to talk a bit about the Vancouver Rat Project, um, whose aims were originally to look at some of these uh, potential pathogens here in Vancouver. So we know that rats can carry a number of pathogens. What do we have here, and do we need to worry about them? Um, and so as Jen was saying, uh, the Vancouver Rat Project was started back in 2010 by Dr. Chelsea Hemsworth. Um, and we've been, uh, I'm going to show you some of what we know already from past research and where we've been going um, recently. So uh, here's a map of the downtown east side, and from the original phase one research back in 2011-2012, Dr. Hemsworth wanted to determine what sort of pathogens we had, um, what the prevalence was of those pathogens, where they were. And so this graph uh, is essentially showing you the trapping area of the downtown east side. Uh, you've got the international shipping port, where of course we can have rats coming in and bringing their lovely pathogens with them. Thank you so much adorable rats. Um, and so everywhere you see red circles, that is indicating trapped rats, and where you have blocks with the hashing, that indicates blocks where there was trapping, um, but no rats were caught. And so uh, in total, we had 725 rats from phase one in 43 blocks over the course of one year. And so um, we were looking for a number of targeted pathogens. So those ones, as Agatha was saying, the ones that we know that rats can carry and transmit to people. So we were looking for plague, though rats don't really do well with the plague either. <laughs> if we start seeing rats dead everywhere in our streets, then we might really start worrying about it. Um, but definitely a concern. Uh, Bartonella's, Rickettsia's, uh, Hantavirus, and Leptospira. So the ones that we know they can transmit. And in addition to that, uh, what makes the Vancouver Rat Project, I think, so, so cool is looking for some other things that rats could potentially carry but aren't the known reservoirs. So uh, MRSA, Salmonella, E. coli, and C. diff. Um, and essentially saying, you know, given their very classy lifestyles of running around in garbage and human feces, perhaps they could pick these things up and maybe uh, be a carrier for us as well. And so what did we find? Well, um, rats carry many a thing. Uh, they don't have plagues, so woohoo, good for us. Um, <laughs> No Rickettsia typhi and no Hantavirus, but definitely a Leptospira, which is concerning uh, Bartonella species and um, all of these other associated pathogens as well. I won't go into depth about these. Um, I'm actually giving a talk on Halloween about rats at Cafe Scientifique, so if you want to hear more about that, you can come hear about rat detectives there. <laughs> um, but what I do want to show you is one of the really cool things about this research is that what Chelsea found was that the pathogens were clustered. So there were some areas in the downtown east side where we had many infected rats. Uh, so you can see in this, this red circle danger zone there, uh, that is a high prevalence of leptospira, whereas in the surrounding blocks, very few rats were infected. And so this hinted at the idea that there could be some kind of, almost like a quarantining effect of diseases within rat populations, perhaps based off of uh, rat movement patterns and rat social interaction. So we know that rats uh, tend to not move too much. They typically stay within about the space of a city block. So if they're not moving between blocks and interacting with surrounding populations, then perhaps very uh, interestingly, we could have um, little spread of disease. So your risk of coming into contact with a diseased rat would be very much based off of the exact block and the population that you were interacting with. It wouldn't be uniform. And so um, another thing that was quite interesting was that with Leptospira, uh, carriage of Leptospira was associated with dominance characteristics. So larger rats, rats with bite wounds, also plays into the idea that it is transmitted through these social interactions, which is why we could potentially see this clustering. And so um, this led us to uh, another research question, um, which was, if we have a stable population where we don't have transmission of disease among blocks, what happens when we go in and we mess that up? Um, if they have tight-knit social, uh, tight social groups, if we go in and do, say, pest control practices where we're removing individuals, one might imagine that if we remove dominant individuals, that could result in a 
total change to the social hierarchy of the rats that are there while they fight uh, to maintain new social dominance order. And so um, we had this hypothesis that if we went in and uh, did a pest control intervention, we might see a change in prevalence of disease. So um, Michael will be talking about that because that was um, his master's project. And then uh, additionally, uh, more recently, because I've decided I never want to finish my PhD, um, we <laughs> were also thinking about the fact that so rats have diseases. Perhaps there's actually no risk uh, or a very little risk of coming into contact with a diseased rat, but that doesn't mean that there's no effect on the people who are living with rats, and there could actually be some kind of um, social or psychological or mental impact of living uh, with rats in the downtown east side. And so I'm going to talk to you a bit about some preliminary data I have um, from interviews that I've done recently with downtown east side residents. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike for question one. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, so to get at this idea of um, pest control influencing pathogen spread, Kaylee and I designed a pest control intervention experiment. Uh, this experiment gave us probably the, the best seven months of our lives, I'm sure. Uh, it ran from June 2016 to January 2017, again in Vancouver's downtown east side. Um, so the basic idea of this experiment was to go into city blocks in the downtown east side, enact a pest control in intervention where we actually simulate what pest control professionals do, and then measure the prevalence of certain pathogens before and after that pest control intervention and see what changes might have occurred. Um, and I've just added this picture. Uh, it shows one of our trapping locations in an alley in the downtown east side. And you can see Kaylee working hard baiting one of our traps. But I also um, added it because I think you can tell from her body language that uh, we probably shouldn't have trapped through uh, the snowpocalypse of last winter. So here is a map of what our study sites look like in the downtown east side. So we have two study sites here. The, the orange blocks correspond to one control site, and the blue blocks correspond to one intervention site. And the green dots are trapping locations down the length of each alley that bisected the city blocks. And so what we did um, in every block, once we laid our traps out, is for the first two weeks, we caught as many rats as we could, sampled them for specific pathogens, which I'll say what, exactly which ones they were later. Uh, then we gave them an ear tag identifier, basically just an ear ring with a number so that we could identify them. And then we re-released them at the exact location that we caught them. Um, and then in the following two weeks, we enacted our pest control intervention in the central city block of just our intervention sites. So for those second two weeks, every rat that we caught in that central city block, we euthanized humanely and removed from the area. And then at the same time, in all the other blocks, all three control blocks, and those two blocks flanking the intervention blocks, we continued to catch and release animals. And then we left for four to six weeks, came back, put our traps in the exact same locations, and then for another two weeks, caught as many rats as we could and re-measured the prevalence. So for our study, um, based on phase one of the Vancouver Rat Project, we knew that rats in the downtown east side might carry any of these pathogens. Uh, but we decided to focus on two of them, uh, Leptospirin tergans and Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. And we chose these two pathogens um, for the, the specific reason that we know that they're transmitted uh, in different ways within rat populations. And we hypothesized that if pest control was going to have an impact on pathogens in rat populations, it would probably do so differently um, for pathogens that are transmitted in different ways. So as Kaylee was talking about earlier, um, leptospirin tergans is transmitted uh, rat to rat via specific social interactions, perhaps aggression, um, while MRSA is predominantly environmentally acquired and has a really low rate of rat to rat transmission. Uh, so just to reiterate, this is a more analytic form of our question. Uh, we were asking what were the odds that rats were positive for leptospira or MRSA um, before the intervention versus after the intervention. Um, and so here is just a little uh, picture mashup of what a day looked like for us in the downtown east side. Um, we would meet every morning at 7 a.m. to begin what later became called uh, a rat safari, <laughs> in which we would go around, check all of our traps, um, and when we caught a rat, we'd bring them in these cages to the back of our mobile laboratory van, which you can just see in the background of that first picture. Um, and we'd put on our rat wrangling gloves, which were, which were bite-proof, 
and then very carefully put our hands into the cage. Uh, this took, when we, when we first started, uh, we, we did this in the van, and we may have lost a few individuals into the van. Um, but luckily that was part of the pilot study. So, yeah, so we would grab the rat by its tail, and then we put him in these anesthesia induction chambers, which are essentially just Tupperwares that we could hook up to the anesthesia machine, which you can see in the background of the, the third picture. Um, and then we would knock the rat out, put him on our table, and I'll start with MRSA. So for MRSA, we swab each individually, uh, orally and rectally, and then later sent these swabs to the Animal Health Center in Abbotsford to test them for uh, MRSA. Uh, so here is a map of the distribution of uh, MRSA positive um, rats in the downtown east side. You can see the distribution is relatively limited to um, a, a few blocks on the left hand side here. And the overall prevalence in our pooled sample was only about 5%. So did we see an effect of um, our pest control intervention? Uh, no, we didn't. So for MRSA, there was no change in the prevalence or the odds of carriage after the intervention as compared to before the intervention. This was true in the blocks where we actually did the pest control and in control blocks and in those two blocks flanking the blocks where we did the pest control. Um, and perhaps this has something to do with the mode of transmission in rat populations, but that's not something that we we're actually able to test because we can't follow rats into their homes and see MRSA transmitted from rat to rat. Uh, we did try, but it didn't work. Um, so on to Leptospira and uh, This was... So to test rats for Leptospira and we had to get urine from each individual. And I'll, I'll say that this, this took a little while to figure out exactly how to do this. Um, there was a lot of bladder squeezing and um, other fun things. But we eventually settled on the configuration that you see in this picture. So we took each rat in uh, their individual cages and placed them over these highly specialized <laughs> dollar store urine collection trays. Um, covered them in a blanket and just waited for them to urinate into the tray. Um, and then using PCR we tested the urine for Leptospira. So again, here's a map. This is the distribution of Leptospira. It's a bit more spread out through our entire study area. And the prevalence was quite a bit higher, so it's 15% of our overall sample. Um, so again, did we see an effect of our pest control intervention? Um, this time we did. So um, the, the odds ratio, the adjusted odds ratio in our final model was 9.55. So what this means specifically is that the rats we caught after the intervention in the block where we actually enacted our pest control had 9.55 times the odds of carrying leptospirin tyrogens as compared to rats caught before the intervention. So, before the, uh, so based on this data, um, it looks like pest control has the potential to actually increase the prevalence or the odds of carriage of leptospirin tyrogens in the rat population that's not removed as part of the pest control intervention. And so <laughs> this is uh, particularly important um, for rat pest control because <coughs> when uh, we call in pest control professionals and they do this at a block level or um, in a building, they typically leave behind a proportion of the rat population because they, it's really hard to remove the entire population of rats. And so that remaining rat population, there's the potential that we're going to increase the, the prevalence of Leptospira in those remaining rats. Um, and I think the, the take home from this is not that if you do rat culling, you're going to increase a bunch of diseases, and it's going to be a horrible pandemic. Um, it's more that when, when we go into a population of zoonotic reservoirs, like rats or, or bats, and we start killing them indiscriminately with um, little knowledge of their ecology, we could have all these unintended consequences that we can't predict. And uh, we'll move on now to the, the second research question. I always forget that we spent so much of our time just waiting for rats to pee. It's very <laughs> depressing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so recently we decided to start this, uh, this other research question looking at experiences of downtown Eastside residents with rats um, and to get an idea of their perceptions of rats, stories that are told about or by residents about rats um, and, and what they think should be done about rats. So, uh, over the course of a couple weeks, um, 
I performed uh, 20 in-person interviews with members of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. We have a really great working relationship with this group. We've been working with them since the Vancouver RAP project started back in 2010. And um, we did semi-structured interviews, so we had some questions that we really wanted to ask, but mostly we just sort of uh, interviewed and followed up wherever those stories uh, happened to take us. So I'm going to share with you a, a, some preliminary results. I'm not even through transcription, um, but some of the main themes that have come out so far. So, um, rats symbolize disease and filth. Perhaps not surprising. Um, the idea that rats can carry diseases, I think this, is, this quote's really strong. Uh, it's, you know, like one bite and God knows what can happen to you. Rat bites came up repeatedly among participants um, in the interviews, uh, particularly fear of themselves being bitten, but more so the fear of children being bitten. Um, not necessarily their own children, but children in the downtown east side in general. Um, and when asked about why they symbolize disease or filth, garbage came up. Garbages came up a lot. So you're always seeing them in the garbages, and so that's, that's just why I think of them as filthy. So definitely a strong connection between disease and, uh, and filth. They're also associated with feelings of uneasiness and fear. Uh, this quote to me was quite strong. It was a story told by one of the participants about hearing what seemed like thousands of rats in the roof of a 7-Eleven. So uh, there were tons of them running across um, the garbage garage doors on top of the garage. Oh my God, it freaked me out. Like it just freaked me out. It just, ugh, scared me. I thought they were gonna come falling out of the ceiling or something. It was horrible. This story happened back in 2009 with this participant and it's still very real, that feeling came across that it's still something that they think about often, um, and when they think about a story of a rat, this was the first thing that came out for them. And this was sort of a trend where many participants had at least one story of feeling unease or fear from rats. In addition to that, uh, rats can affect sleep quality and time. Um, this individual identified as homeless and was speaking particularly about living with their partner on the streets and the idea of needing to guard their partner from the rats. Uh, they go away about when the sun starts, well, when it, not when the sun comes up, but when it starts getting a little, they must go to sleep or something, because they definitely come back out in the afternoon, but from about four until noon or so, you're pretty rat free. If I get sleep, that's about the time that I get it, or I can. So uh, a few participants mentioned that they actually changed their sleep patterns to daylight hours instead of in the evening when they could hear rats uh, on the streets or in the walls of their buildings and definitely affects on um, sleep patterns. What was quite interesting too is that it seemed quite pronounced that there was a greater impact on individuals who identified as homeless than those who uh, had housing. So um, particularly individuals who had spent some time in tents. Uh, this participant um, shared a story when they were uh, living in a tent underneath the viaduct and essentially saying that um, they, they didn't feel like they could go home. They were afraid that they, if they went home they might encounter a rat. And that now that they have housing, that this, this feeling is not, as, uh, is not as intense, but that at the time this was one of their greatest concerns in order of importance. Uh, this, this quote really summed up, I think, um, the, the general feeling of the individuals I talked to, that it's just exhausting. You never, you can never, they're just, they're so fucking persistent, they won't leave you alone. You live on the east side and you live outside being homeless, I don't know, maybe people with homes, they don't have this kind of problem, but I'm outside all the time and they're always there. They're always there. And this is something that came up repeatedly. When I asked participants how many rats they saw a day, I typically got somewhere between 20 and 50. Um, the general response was, anytime I go in an alley, I see a rat. And I asked, do you do anything to avoid rats? They said, no, there's no point. <laughs> no point to avoid rats. Uh, you're just going to see them. You're just going to encounter them. They have no fear of you, which is quite interesting. This to me was, uh, so far, <laughs> one of the, the most interesting uh, results is that there was a clear feeling of um, fear or uneasiness around rats or that people didn't like rats, but that on a scale of importance, they don't even factor. They're, they're not important. Um, like, come on, 
Let's deal with homelessness before we deal with the rat situation seriously. Honestly, like putting money into something like that is just silly over homelessness, right? This participant is the one that talked about the garage full of a thousand rats. Um, but they don't feel that rats are important in comparison to other things that could be, uh, could be done in the downtown east side. One of the other trends that sort of come out through these interviews is that the, the idea is that the rats are just always there, they'll always be there, and no one will ever do anything about it because the city's not interested in cleaning up the downtown east side for the residents. So uh, this has been a very... Um, interesting process. I really enjoyed going through the interviews and I'm looking forward to synthesizing this uh, as more data comes out. So um, to bring it back to our overall conclusions from the Vancouver Rep Project, uh, phase two and three and the next five billion phases I guess, because just <laughs> Chelsea always calls it the project that won't die. Um, pest control practices seem to be associated with an increase of uh, some pathogens, primary, or leptospira in this case, um, that there can be implications for disease risk to people and that there may also be other risks that aren't associated with disease, but other potential health impacts from just living with rats um, in the environment. And so with that, it's our uh, thank you slide to everyone who's contributed to the Vancouver Rat Project. Um, if you're interested, there's also a small documentary on the CBC uh, Keeping Canada Safe about the Rat Project. You can see our rat van <laughs> driving around the downtown east side. But with that, um, thank you so much. <laughs> so good. Um, and yay, now the sound is back too, so we can answer some of the questions that came in from online. And I know there's two of them, so we'll get to the online questions first. And these two are for Kaylee and Michael, so you can come right back up on stage. Um, I'll just read them both at the same time, because they're both John Cresley's excellent questions. Um, the first was, why was the downtown east side chosen for sampling rather than, say, West Point Gray? Uh, <laughs> and the second question, having spent a lot of time in both areas, I can guess what the answer is. Here. Um, and the other question is, is there any evidence that people are getting germs from rats or the other way around? Which direction are things going? When John said it, when he said germs, he meant uh, human pathogens. Human pathogens, he means. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take this? Okay. Um, so why did we target the downtown east side? So the reason the downtown east side has been the focus of the Vancouver Rat Project is because of uh, potential risks to people. So in the downtown east side, we have a population that uh, we have many homeless individuals living in the downtown east side, so they may be more likely to come into contact with rats. Um, and due to, say, uh, effects of homelessness and poverty, the, the risks then of perhaps being immunocompromised and becoming sick if one comes into contact with a disease rat was believed to be greater, which is why the downtown east side has been the focus of the rat project. Um, in terms of transmission to people, uh, Dr. Hemsworth has done some previous research looking at uh, MRSA. MRSA? Yeah. Oh, recently? Yeah. Okay. MRSA and lepto in people. We know that in MRSA, the, the strain that is carried by people is indistinguishable from the strain that's carried in rats. Can't say anything about the direction in which it's going, but it does seem that they're sharing that strain. You want to talk about lepto? Uh, Sure, yeah. They did a, a seroprevalence study for um, lepto, which is, it's not published yet, and there was no detectable leptospira in the people that they sampled. Um, and why this is, we don't really know. Uh, it was a small sample, perhaps they just missed it. But I think a, a lot of the problems with detecting transmission of these sort of diseases in a place like the downtown east side uh, is number one, uh, many of them are just febrile in general in their appearance, and so people just get, you know, a fever, they might go in and get some antibiotics, get treated, and it never gets diagnosed. So there's a lot of that going on. And then in a population like uh, the downtown east side, people are getting sick all the time anyways because they're injecting drugs and so forth. And so there's a really high rate of misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. Questions from in the room? Uh, so you want to know if um, we're looking at any other pest control practices and whether uh, they might have different effects? Yeah. 
Um, so, so the funny thing is, is we know what sort of pest control practices actually do work at keeping the population down over time. Um, the reason that we focus on these kill-based methods is because that's the easiest way to do things, and um, policymakers and pest control professionals, they just do it because it's quick uh, and relatively cheap. But if you really want to deal with a rat population, you have to do what's called ecological-based pest management, in which you actually um, change the environment to limit resources available to the rats. And that's really the only way that you can um, sustainably deal with a rat population over time. Um, and the second part of that question is, are we going to look at any of those um, in terms of pathogens? Uh, the answer is probably not, because uh, it, it doesn't really uh, matter so much. And the, the point of this study was to show um, these culling methods. Uh, we already know that these culling methods are ineffective at dealing with rat populations. Now, on top of that, this study shows that they have the potential to have these unintended consequences. So it's kind of just like, another nail in the coffin saying we shouldn't do this anymore. Uh, we already know the better alternative. There's a good question online here that I will ask. Um, oh, I'll ask it into the mic so that the online people and everybody can hear. This is such a cool question. Rats are smart. Does their age or, wait for it, their microbiome have any influence <laughs> on being trap happy or trap shy? Trap happy versus trap shy. Um, microbiome, did you tweet this at us no, in, I, in the meantime? Oh my goodness. So we don't, uh, we actually don't know much about um, rat characteristics and, and trap shyness versus trap happiness. We do know, do know that some rats are um, more keen to enter traps than others. We had one rat, Lazarus. We caught him eight times. Lazarus, because the first time we caught him, we thought he was dead, and then he came back to life. Um, yeah, Lazarus we caught eight or nine times to the point that he was always uh, rubbing his little face in the front of the cage, and he lost a little fur here. He had a little cute little diamond. Oh, we love Lazarus. Um, but we don't know too much about effects of, say, something like the microbiome. What I will say is that we're actually analyzing the data now to look at how um, these sorts of mark recapture studies can bias the sorts of results we get. So we're looking to see um, how long it takes for rats to re-enter uh, re traps and whether that's related to age or size. We're looking to see whether or not there is a bias towards whether or not we catch more diseased rats at the beginning of trapping versus not. Um, so hopefully, stay tuned, <laughs> we'll have that data for you in a little bit. <laughs> The, the main problem with that question is that you don't know what you don't trap, so yeah. it's a really hard thing to study. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, is there any evidence that the, the two pathogens that you were looking at, did, does it actually kill the rats themselves? No. Um, so for lepospire interrogants, we do know, based on laboratory studies and um, mm -hmm. you know, field studies, that it doesn't cause any symptoms in the rats whatsoever, so they're just lifelong carriers of it. Oh, okay. So it doesn't affect their behavior either? Uh, not so far as we can detect. Um, but MRSA, uh, we don't really know. There's only been the one study, or I guess three studies now on that, and no one's looked at behavior associations. We'll do one more, and then we'll wrap up. How have the residents of the Japanese site responded to the, the work you guys do, and how has that affected the results at all? Ooh, which ties in with another John Parsley question from the internet, which was, would this potentially contribute to stigma? Oh, great question. Um, the, the overall response has been really positive, and I think that's because we've worked with Vandu so closely. So we worked with Vandu from designing the project and having um, the first phase of the project actually had members from Vandu as research assistants as well and going through and checking traps. So uh, in many ways, members of the community are our own uh, educators around rats to other downtown east side residents. I can't tell you how many times we would come upon residents and they'd be like, oh yeah, that's the Vancouver Rat Project's traps and they're catching rats to look at blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's actually been really well received. Um, as far as contributing to stigma, I'm not sure that it does. I think the, the stigma around rats from my interviews, it's, it's already there, but what's so interesting is the, the, the level of importance. So people um, articulated that they think about rats only when they see them, they don't like them, but otherwise they haven't thought much about them. Um, we've been down there trapping on and off over the last five, six years, and there hasn't really been any indication to me that that has had any result on the perceptions of rats in the downtown side. All right, we'll 
wrap up, join me in thanking all of our amazing speakers. Like the really big rat, also please come help yourself. <laughs> um, and have a wonderful party. Thank you.